Hello, everyone. Welcome. We still have some people coming in, so we're going to start in about one minute. Great to see everyone. Welcome everyone, great to see you. We'll be starting in about 30 seconds. Okay, hi, my name is Brian McDonald. I am Director of Client Relations for Anja Education Consultants. And I'd like to welcome everyone to the webinar today where for the next 20 minutes, We'll be sharing our key insights and best tactics for college admissions. Then we're going to quickly give you a couple of options if you'd like to meet us, meet with us privately to discuss how we might be able to help your individual situation. And then the balance of the time is for your questions. Okay, great. I'd like to introduce the president of Anja Education Consultants. Anjali Mazel is a former Princeton University interviewer, TED Talk speaker, and college admissions expert. She's also the proud mom of a thriving 26-year-old, now in grad school. Anjali has helped hundreds of students get into their top perfect match schools, including Yale and Stanford, John Hopkins, Vanderbilt, Swarthmore, and UT Austin, to name just a few. Okay, thanks again for being here today, and it's over to you, Anjali. Thanks, Brian. Hi, everybody. Very glad to be with you today. I know that many of you are here because you can clearly see that applying to college has become much more challenging, and many of you are probably feeling some combination of excitement and anxiety. So let me first begin by just acknowledging that I really understand these feelings as a parent and as a professional. And by the end of this talk today, after I outline the specific challenges and solutions, I think you're going to feel not only much more clear and in control of this process, but confident and aligned with what you truly want. So I'd like to start by telling you a brief story. I grew up in New York City and went to an extremely competitive high school. And just to give you an idea... I had five or six hours of homework at night, and I felt really oppressed. I did well despite this, but I couldn't wait to get out of there and go to college. My senior year in high school was truly bizarre. My classmates and their parents got together and offered me cash to withdraw my applications after I was admitted early to Yale. Apart from the unsettling feeling that this gave me, I had not decided if I really wanted to attend that school. I wanted to see which other options would open up for me in the spring. And as it turned out, I ended up not going to Yale, but to Princeton instead. But this experience left me feeling really ill at ease. And when planning my own son's education, I was determined that he would not suffer from that kind of crushing, toxic academic environment that I had endured, which in retrospect, I, I felt did not really serve me in the long run. So I wanted my son to be happy first and foremost, but also successful. So how to strike the right balance? The difficulty started with choosing a high school for him. He went back and forth between kind of competitive, well-known prep schools and a small unknown school that prioritized love of learning and independent projects. And I realized that either way, there would be trade-offs. But in the end, I chose a small school where my son found his passion. And given that I had been an interviewer for many years for Princeton, as well as a teacher who wrote letters of recommendation to students and gave college essay guidance, you would think it would have been easy for me to guide my son through his college applications, right? <laughs> Not at all. So I hired a colleague to work with him. After many months, at the end of a surprisingly difficult process, he got into an Ivy League school, but that is not what he chose. He made what some of us might think was a very unexpected choice, and I will tell you about it at the end of the webinar. So what I want you to know at this point is that I have been where you all are. 
Although I knew the system well, when my son applied to call college, I had complicated feelings. Like many parents, I was vulnerable to confusion, frustration, fear, but I did learn something important. I discovered that my son, like all of you here today, was facing a threefold problem when applying to college. Number one, increased competition. Number two, the complexity of the application process. And number three, the rising cost of college. Now, what does this challenge look like in practice? So first, let's consider the competitiveness of college admissions. If you were a Texas student in the 90s and graduated in the top 20% of your graduating class, you were automatically admitted to the University of Texas at Austin. Today, you'll need to graduate in the top 6% of your class to be automatically admitted. If you were applying to Yale in the 1990s, you had an 18% chance of admission. Now it's under 5%. And 75% of USC applicants were admitted in the 90s, but in 2022, the admission rate is now under 12%. And some of you may have read a recent Wall Street Journal article about a young woman with an SAT score of 1550, a GPA of 3.95, and phenomenal extracurricular and leadership positions who applied to top tier colleges and got into none of them. So there's no doubt that college admissions today is super competitive. Now let's look at the complexity of the application process. So 20 years ago, you might have applied to one or two colleges. The process was clear, simple, and straightforward. And now because of all the many moving parts of the applications, students are applying to many more colleges, as many as eight to 15 for our students. So there's a lot to stay on top of. And to give you a glimpse into the complexity of the college planning and application process, take a look at all the elements that need to be in place for students to have optimal merit, scholarship, and admission results. So recently, for example, a friend of mine was telling me about the ordeal of helping his son apply to college last fall the numbers of different essays for each college, the completely different online applications to fill in, SAT prep, sending letters of rec, different deadlines, and on and on and on. All this was a ton of work and created months of tension with his son. So clearly this complexity needs to be simplified. So after the complexity and the competitiveness of college admissions, the fact is that college has gotten incredibly expensive. If you'll please look at this graph and brace yourself, this really illustrates how the cost of college tuition has exploded. The red line here on the bottom is the rate of inflation. And as you can see, the black line on the top is the rate of increase in college tuition. Clearly college tuition has massively outpaced inflation for decades now. Private colleges can cost up to $77,000 per year, while in-state tuition for public schools can cost up to $28,000 per year. But here is the good news. Merit scholarships can be worth tens of thousands of dollars and even hundreds of thousands of dollars. This is the type of scholarship that does not depend on family income, merit scholarships. So how do we do this? There are three quick success stories that I wanna share with you, which illustrate how students can gain a competitive edge, simplify the complexity and maximize scholarships to reduce the cost of college. Let's start with Tony. When uh, we first met Tony early in 11th grade, he had high A's and an SAT score in the 1500s. He was stellar in math, so his teacher and family were naturally pushing him towards engineering. But after talking with Tony, he made it very clear that engineering was not what he wanted. However, and this was the game changer, we discovered that he had a significant talent and passion in art as well as STEM. So he found a local art mentor a summer program to develop a portfolio, and that portfolio 
could then be included in his application. Exploring his interest in visual arts and combining this with his talent in math led Tony to discover a passion for architecture. And this discovery made all the difference because it really made Tony stand out. Why? Because now Tony had a story to tell and nothing will make you stand out from the crowd in college admissions more than having your own story that demonstrates genuine passion and growth. So to summarize, Tony discovered his passion. We simplify the application process, guiding him to a clear major and path he loved, architecture. And as a result, Tony secured $100,000 scholarship to Tulane. And by curating, curating his portfolio and targeting his essays to align with architecture and his new vision for himself, Tony found a competitive edge. The result? Tony was admitted to Rice, his first choice, where he was, has now finished a successful couple of years. In this way, Tony solved the threefold problem of college admissions. So not all of us, though, are straight-A students like Tony. Many of us get a mixture of A's and B's. We might have a down year, get sick, or be in a competitive high school, but we are still ambitious. And this was Ellen. Ellen had a B average from a competitive high school, but was confident about thriving in a selective college. We discovered that her GPA had significantly improved over the three years of high school through her hard work. When she got Bs, she didn't give up. It motivated her to get tutoring and find a college professor as a mentor. And she kept signing up for challenging classes. She also rose to a leadership position in yearbook and got a summer internship in a startup incubator to explore a major in business. But how was she going to pull all these threads together to showcase her accomplishments? Ellen worked to tell her story as a journey of growth and responsibility. This was the compelling story, which was possible because we helped her pull all the threads together. Ellen demonstrated through her essays and applications how she learned from setbacks, how these setbacks led to her development and improvement. In fact, they became assets. So maybe you or your child are like Ellen, you discovered a specific passion halfway through high school, or maybe you began to excel by the end of junior year, or maybe you are a straight-A student who had a clear major in mind from the start. Either way, you may not recognize what is exceptional about you, and everybody has a powerful story to tell. So you need to tell your story in a memorable way, your passions, your challenges, your successes. So to summarize, for Ellen, she simplified the application process by keeping accountable and breaking down the long list of tasks into small steps. She submitted standout applications and eventually received 12 scholarship offers, ranging from $20,000 to $100,000. Ellen gained a competitive edge by pulling all her academic and extracurricular experiences together into a strong story in the essays and interviews. So despite her GPA, she was admitted as a business major to Emory University, her first choice. So Ellen clearly solved the threefold problem of college admissions. Now, Grace's story is slightly different. She uh, had an A, B mixed GPA, no test scores, and had a remarkable singing talent she needed to showcase. So what was the solution to the threefold problem of admissions for Grace? First, simplify the process by keeping her organized and on task through spreadsheets and find an application tracking system. Second, keep costs down by optimizing all aspects of the application and tailoring the college list. In Grace's case, she was awarded scholarships ranging from $80,000 to $199,000. Third, as Grace was a singer, she gained a competitive edge by curating her vocal submissions and helping her get admitted into the super selective Grammy summer camp. In the end, she was accepted to her first choice 
college, the very prestigious California Institute of the Arts. She turned down this other $200,000 scholarship from Columbia College, Chicago. So the three students that we discussed, Tony, Ellen, and Grace, were all success stories, but very different from one another. Yet for all these students, they solved the problem of complexity, competitiveness, and cost of college. Through these case studies, we hope you've gotten some valuable tips on what to prioritize in college planning. And before we answer your questions, which will be the largest part of this webinar today is going to be uh, individualized question and answers. Uh, let's first answer the most common question that people have, which is how you can work with us. So before we give you the three simple options, here is our track record. 2022 scholarship results for our 2022 application cycle, our students received over $2 million in scholarships and our average total four-year scholarships per student was 182,000. So the return on investment for our families was very high and our fees were paid for many times over. Now, uh, this, in this same application cycle for 2022, students we worked with were admitted to some of the most selective colleges in the country, including Stanford, Dartmouth, University of Pennsylvania, Johns Hopkins, as well as excellent schools such as UC Riverside, Penn State, Ohio State, Texas A&M, and many, many more. But best of all, these colleges, and we made sure of that, were the right fit for each applicant. So if you want to gain a competitive edge, simplify the application process and keep costs down, like the hundreds of students we've helped ace college admissions, here are the three simple options. So option one is for eighth to 10th grade students. And we have in this case, the time to help identify your kids' talents, discover their passions, and make sure they really get on track. This option also maximizes admissions and scholarships results when they apply to college. We help optimize their GPA, test scores, extracurriculars, and summer planning. And packages start at $24.97. Option two is for the 11th and 12th grade. And this is a two-year package. It's the A-list package, our most popular one. It will give you a competitive edge, simplify the complex application process, keep costs low. We will optimize essays, SAT prep, and testing in collaboration with method learning, as well as application summer planning and demonstrated interest score. And this package where you work directly with me costs $19,997 with the ability to provide some level of customization depending on your situation. Option three is the same package as the A-list, but instead of working with me, you will work with one of the advisors we have handpicked and trained, and the cost of that two-year package is $79.97. So if you're serious about working with us, please sign up for our free discovery session and bring your questions. Students, please have both parents with you. So sign up for when they are available and parents, please bring your spouse. So uh, please, uh, Alexis, our wonderful moderator will drop the sign up link in the chat now. So Alexis, if you would be kind enough to uh, put that uh, link in there. And again, this session is designed to explore our packages and answer your questions. Students, please bring your parents. So sign up for when they can attend. Parents, please bring your spouse. Okay, so before I answer your questions, um, I would like to uh, finish the story about my son. And he, uh, the story of my son, which was that he applied to uh, college a few years ago. And at the end of the process, I mentioned he did, in fact, get into an Ivy League school, but that is not what he chose. Instead, after a lot of research, investigation, deep reflection, and a visit to campus, 
My son chose an amazing school, Carleton College in Minnesota, which you may or may not have heard of, but it turns out employers, graduate schools, and prestigious fellowships know very well. It was by far a better choice for him than the Ivy. At Carleton, my son got more attention, classes were more targeted, his professors advocated for him. He stood out. And after his freshman year, he was awarded the Orion Mission Internship at NASA and a second Orion Mission Internship at NASA the following summer in college. Today, he's in grad school at an Ivy League college and tells me that in retrospect, although some disagreed with his college choice, this was absolutely the right decision for him. And best of all, for me as a mom, he is happy and thriving. So, Parents and students, you may be anxious right now, but I can assure you there are many roads to success. Please remember that college is not a destination. The college application process can help you begin to discover a sense of purpose, a great first step in designing a life that has meaning and financial stability. And that's what I wish for you all. So, Let's um, see what questions you're asking. Uh, please, uh, Alexis, if you would put the link in the chat again for uh, the uh, uh, information session, the uh, discovery session, students, please bring your parents and parents, please bring your spouse. Okay, very good. Um, I am just going to briefly share my screen and then we can get started with the questions. Okay, so question for biochemistry majors, what would be a great school in your opinion? Okay, so, you know, this is a good question because um, what we want is for the major, certainly for the school to offer your major, right? But we also, we also want the college to be a place where you will thrive. So what, does, what is a best fit college? Major is just one component. It's just one component. Remember, this is four years of your life. Um, often, a parents and students will focus on just one thing. They might focus on the rank of the college, or they might focus on the major. Now, the major, I'm not discounting that the major is important. Uh, in fact, that's what you need to check first. You need to check does this college offer that my major? Um, I would say that for STEM majors, what's going to be extremely important is the availability of research. How easy is it for undergraduates, for you at the college level, to be able to engage in research projects? Uh, look at schools that you're interested in and um, look at their department. See how many faculty members are on that department. What do the core courses look like? What do the um, research projects of the faculty members look like? So I would go a little deeper than just to see if the college actually offers the major. I mean, there, there are lists online, um, you know, best colleges for X or Y major. And you can certainly look at that. Um, However, you know, we know that most of the rankings uh, have are very controversial, even U.S. News and World Report, um, you know, many um, of the top, for example, medical schools and law schools have been dropping out because there, there have been uh, questions about the validity of, of rankings. So I'd be careful with that. I'd go deeper and I would look at the uh, department website, uh, be sure you spend time looking at all those factors that I mentioned, uh, because what you want is to end up in a school that is going to offer you the kinds of core, the kind of core curriculum that you're going to want, enough electives, um, and a wide enough uh, program for different research. That doesn't mean it has to be a large school. Sometimes a liberal arts school. I mentioned Carleton College. Many of the great liberal arts schools in this country 
have incredible research, which is even more available than national universities. So please uh, don't limit yourself, look department by department, and then you're gonna start to see constants and you're going to start to see variables and you're going to be able to see compared to department to department, okay? So when you're building your college list or when you're whittling down your college list, yes, major has to be at the top, but go deeply and then add on the other factors as well. Okay, so other question, how much does class rank count? I attend a fairly competitive school and have all A's, but my class rank is in the top 15% and not top 5%. Yeah, so, you know, the great thing about this country is that uh, there are hundreds and hundreds um, of fantastic colleges. Uh, don't fall into the trap of thinking that uh, it, because it's a myth, and I'll explain why it's a myth, uh, of thinking that you have to get into whatever, a top 20 or top 30 nationally ranked school, uh, you know, taking that ranking from US News or what, whatever system you're looking at. Um, the reason it's a myth is that studies have been done that show that long-term success, professional success term in terms of uh, salaries, in terms of uh, professional satisfaction, long-term uh, good outcomes for students going to college. What's important, it's what you do when you get there, okay? It's not what the rank of the college is. Now, there's one exception, and that is for first-generation college students. When it's a first-generation college student, then um, the rank of the college can help because there's an upward mobility there that is um, enhanced. But apart from first-generation students, uh, for most uh, other students, what you want to do is be sure that you can go to a college where you can get mentored by professors, you can do independent research projects with professors, and you can actively participate in student organizations and campus life. Because the sense of belonging that those three foster have been linked to higher GPA in college and higher GPA in college then is linked to better results with graduate schools and with jobs, okay? So I know that you want me to answer this question, you know, yes or no, does class rank count? But, you know, I understand what's behind the question, right? There's a kind of a sense that, you know, um, there are only a certain limited number of schools. That's what I think is behind the question. Now, to answer your question directly, um, class rank, you know, some colleges will say class rank doesn't matter. Um, I, I don't agree. I, I think that colleges um, cannot, they're not going to admit, you know, 50 kids from, from one school, right? So they want a, a variety of different people from different parts of the countries and different parts of the country, different schools. So what you, what you need to do is simply um, do, you know, do the best you can, right? Um, you're in the top 15% at a, at a competitive school. The good news is that the colleges know which high schools, if it's a well-known high school, if it's a you know large public or well-known private high school, they know the level of com competitiveness. So they, they are able to um, compare students in a way that takes rigor into account. Rigor, academic rigor is one of the most important factors in college admissions. So this is going to play to your advantage, right? Um, I would not get too worried about this, okay? Because um, the college admissions process, and again, I'm going big picture for a reason, for a reason. College admissions process can be an amazing experience of discovery and growth. Um, it can also be the most stressful thing that you've done in your life so far. So what I'm telling you is it doesn't have to be stressful. It does not have to be stressful in, in the sense that um, there are many more options out there than you might think. 
So that's, um, I hope that that has been, you know, helpful. Um, okay. Um, now, while we're waiting for more questions, let me quickly share a little known tactic that can, with certain select schools, including many selective schools, increase your chances of admission by as much as 400%. Okay, would you like to know what that is? <laughs> that ta tactic is called applying early decision. Um, now, early action and early decision are both uh, are early application options, uh, but they are very different in terms of commitment and flexibility. So uh, early decision is a binding agreement between the student and the college. So for example, if a student is admitted under early decision, uh, they are required to attend that college and withdraw all of their other applications. This option is typically for students who have a clear first choice and are willing to make a commitment to attend that college if they are admitted. Um, early action is non-binding, which means that the student can apply to other colleges and does not have to make a commitment to attend the college until the regular decision deadline. This option is typically for students who want to get an early decision, who want to get the results early, but they want to keep their options open. Early action will increase your chances in some cases compared to the regular admission uh, process, but usually not by much. Sometimes it's about the same. So again, for many schools, early decision is a binding commitment to attend the college of admitted, if admitted, giving you the best chance while early action is non-binding. So when I said 400%, this is, um, this is true of certain schools. Um, those, uh, those statistics are very easy to find for the most part. Um, and, you know, some schools have that amazing boost for early decision. A place like Tulane, for example, is a great example, right? Um, some of the liberal arts schools. Why? Because they're filling up their freshman class very quickly. Um, often uh, the higher the what they call the yield, which is the number of per percentage of students admitted who actually enroll. The higher the yield, uh, you know, the lower the um, advantage of ED is going to be. So this is a this is a statistic you can look up. Uh, it's called yield. But um, you think about it now. Or the only people that truly should not uh, do early decision are uh, if you if merit scholarships are very important for you. Uh, if you apply early decision, the college has no incentive whatsoever to give you extra money because basically you've said no matter what your what you offer us financial you know merit aid or anything else we're going to attend. So it's a bit of a trade off, right? Um, some family for some families it's perfectly okay to do that uh, because they get the boost in admissions, and for other families there's no way that ED makes sense because you need to get all the answers at the end, all the decisions at the end, and then be able to negotiate. By the way, there is such a thing as negotiating your merit aid. So if there are any seniors here who've already applied, uh, keep that in mind. It's not called negotiating, it's called appealing, right? Uh, there's a good way and a not great way to do that. Uh, there's, there's some... Uh, you know, it depends on the la language of how you present it. Uh, this is something that we work with our clients on is negotiating merit scholarships, helping uh, to give them the tools to be able to do that. Um, wonderful. So um, now, uh, please don't be don't be shy. I'm here for you. You know, this is a, a, an amazing opportunity you guys have to ask questions, whether you uh, or your parents, uh, whether your kids are in middle school, in high school, if you're 12th graders and you have questions, please put them in uh, because um, you know it's it's quite uh, rare uh, to to be able to um, get this kind of one-on-one -on -one, uh, answer for your questions. Um, now, I have a question for you. 
Do you know the difference between the SAT and the ACT and what a testing strategy should look like? So please um, put that in the Q&A if you know or you do not. Um, I see there's more questions here that, that um, Alexis is showing me um, in the chat. Okay. So yeah, you can put that question about SAT, ACT if you don't know the answer. Okay. Um, and then um, how soon should students begin uh, applying to scholarships and looking at colleges? Okay. Um, I have I have an answer. So this is a good question. The question is, should you take both the SAT and the ACT or just focus on one? Uh, and then there's another question about um, early decision. Okay, so some students feel that they have to take both the SAT and the ACT. Absolutely not. Okay, colleges are looking at the SAT and the ACT exactly the same. There's no advantage. Um, what you want to do is figure out early which of the two you are most likely to score higher on. Most students find that they're better at one or the other test. When we work with students, we have a diagnostic that we give which shows very clearly which of the two they are most likely to score higher on. Once you've identified that, then it's time for you to do intensive test prep. Now, let me say this, until all colleges eliminate the SAT or the ACT, it is to your advantage to prep for the SAT or the ACT. Uh, what you want to do is there are several options to prep. There are free online options. There are local tutors. We have our own tutors that we vet very carefully. What you want is to time the test prep, that tutoring, in a way that's going to give you ample time to take the test, see the results, and if necessary, if necessary see them again. What you don't want to do is take it five times. Just go in there, kind of shotgun approach and just kind of like, oh, okay, I'll just take this one and then I'll take that one and I'll take that. There's no point. Try to keep it to, you know, three times max. If you can do two, that's incredible. Hey, if you could do one time, it just saves you time on the other end. Um, and you can see how, how you are going to score by taking full practice tests under a test conditions. So um, it, it, is, it is still important. We recommend to our students that they take, uh, that they do SAT or ACT prep because these tests, for the most part, of course there are exceptions, but for the most part, they're testing how well you take the test. They're not testing, um, they're supposed to be aptitude tests, but um, it's been shown that um, they, they do have kind of inbuilt biases and other things that make it so that basically the more prep you do, the better it is. Um, and again, plan it in advance. We have a, a timeline, personalized timeline for our students that so that uh, you're not overloading yourself, especially junior year. It's really, really tough. Um, so we try to get um, at least the first one done before junior year. But if you're uh, a current junior and you haven't done it, it's perfectly okay. Don't worry about it, right? At every point, there is something that we can do to enhance well-being as well as achievement. So remember, your well-being, your sanity, your health has to come first. Um, and that's why if you can plan in advance, great. If not, then there is still there are still ways to organize your time so that uh, you're not overloaded. Okay, and other question: Does early decision increase acceptance rates at Ivy League schools? Um, yeah, so there are not many schools that have uh, Ivies that have early decision. Most of them are called restrictive early action or early action. Um, Generally speaking, uh, schools like the Ivy League, uh, schools from the Ivy League, where the yield is very, very high, as I mentioned before, 
um, that early decision is not going to have the greatest impact. Um, you know, the, uh, Cornell is one of the exceptions because it's um, it does have early decision. And uh, so, but, you know, you're going to have to check school by school. I would say on the whole, this is not where you're going to get that huge boost for ED. It's not going to be Ivy League schools. Okay, next. How important are the summer programs pre-college for admission to top schools? Should we aim to do some programs in the school that is our number one choice or specific campuses are not crucial? Okay. Glad you asked that question, okay, because pre-college programs are a great money maker for the college, but they're not going to set you apart, okay? So we're very, very intentional of how we help our kids plan their summers, because what you do with your summer, whether you're going to study, whether you're going to do a research project, where you're gonna, whether you're going to do a mentored um, outreach project, uh, whether you're going to do some kind of volunteering, whether you're going to, to have a job, uh, whether you're going to help with family responsibilities, whatever it is, it needs to truly fit you and your uh, strengths uh, and line things up so that you'll be able to tell a compelling story when the time comes to apply. So uh, try to you know keep that in mind because the pre-college programs that you see now, all colleges are getting into the into the act. Um, they'll offer pre-college, you know, to do a, a series of, of, of classes. Nothing wrong with that. What we recommend is when students are in the eighth, ninth, tenth grade, um, that can still, you know, be helpful. Or if you're exploring a completely new field in eleventh grade. But if you um, already have some summer uh, study experience and you really want to stand out from the crowd and also really want to do something that is meaningful, there may be much, much better options. Um, mostly for the most competitive schools, places like the Ivies, the Ivy Pluses, et cetera, it's not going to matter that you went to you know, Brown pre-college summer program. It's not going to make a bit of difference, right? It's not going to help boost your admission. Um, but there are some smaller schools with the, where the yield, remember this word, yield, you look it up and, and look it up for each college. When the yield is quite low, you know, below 25%, there it can be very important. So it truly depends on you, on your uh, strengths on your aspirations, your uh, educational aspirations. And, uh, you know, I cannot give a very personalized guidance because that I, I need to know the student before I give that, you know, what, which, which summer path would be best. Um, these pre-college programs for the most part, and again, some of them are, are very good and, and, and very helpful and you get to be in a college setting. It really, whether you spend the money on that depends absolutely on you, on your resume, on your transcript. This is what we look at when we advise about summer programs, right? We have to match the program and to your family's financial needs. Um, there are some competitive summer programs, research programs, for example, that not only don't cost anything, but uh, they offer a stipend. That means they pay you. These are very prestigious programs. And of course, they're very, very hard to get into. So, uh, you know, if you're applying to those ones that are either free or they give you a stipend, be sure you're, be sure you're applying to many of them and be sure that you um, get guidance about whether you actually stand a chance because the applications are um, take a long, long time. So you don't want to be, you know, writing... Yeah, essay upon essay, unless there's a real chance that you're going to be admitted. Um, the the pre-college programs and some of the other ones are called pay to play. I mean, they're not called, but this is how we in this uh, industry talk about them. You pay a fee and in return, right, 
you get um, to experience college life over the summer, you get to study, um, you know, and and some of them tend, tend to be on the expensive side, some of them less. Uh, please don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that they're bad, right? I'm saying that to make an informed choice about whether that's the right path for you, it needs to be personalized. We need to take all of your factors into consideration before making that decision. And keep in mind those free programs. Now, if you are not going to be able to do a super competitive free program, research program, and you want to do something a little bit unusual, but you don't have a lot of um, uh, funds to allocate to this, you know, there are amazing ways engaging your local community through volunteering, um, any initiatives. But again, when we work with students, we, we determine first what the strengths of the students are. And based on those strengths, we help them choose which kind of program and which direction to go in um, over, over the summer. Okay. Um, how do you approach applications from students, not from competitive ranked schools, but from rural schools that do not have access to the same curriculum or opportunities? Yeah. So what's good about rural schools that don't have access to the same curriculum or, or opportunities is that colleges are trying to go for uh, geographic diversity. So you've got that working in your favor. And sometimes uh, a student who has not had those opportunities has had other opportunities. You know, maybe there's work on the farm or maybe um, we had a student not too long ago who um, a who didn't have time to do a lot of extracurriculars because he was, uh, he lived in a single parent family and uh, his mother was working many, many hours into the evening. So he had to take care of his sister. He had to pick her up at school. He had to cook for the family. He had to clean the house. I mean, he was the, um, you know, kind of co co-parenting almost. And so he wrote his essay about that and he was admitted to NYU um, into the program that he wanted. And that's got, become a very competitive school. So what I'm trying to say is you may have a very compelling story to tell. Also, if you come from a school or an environment where you haven't had the opportunities and won't have them through when you apply to college, there may, again, there are other things you can talk about and you're definitely going to want to explain, explain what was available, what wasn't available. Some of those things will be visible in the high school report, but it's always good. There are spaces on the applications for students to explain their circumstances. So um, you will have multiple places on the application to talk about that. Um, and at the same time, if you have the time, which you, you may or may not have, but if you have the time, explore some online free resources, things like free courses. Um, I believe that it's uh, MIT that has a whole bunch of courses online for free. Check that, check Harvard. Um, few of the schools have been doing that. So there are many, many different um, resources that you can make use of, even if you come from an environment that has not afforded you either the academic or extracurricular opportunities or both that um, you would have liked. Okay. Uh, I should preface that this rural student has high scores on the AP college courses top of her class class is 19 yeah don't worry about it um when my son graduated from high school he was in a class with two people from a school that nobody had ever heard of uh it worked out fine right uh so and he was at the top of his class as well so i i think don't worry uh this can actually play to your advantage but you have to tell that story in a way that they that the admissions people can hear. 
So, uh, yeah, this is kind of what we do all day long is uh, help students tell their story in a competitive situation. Um, okay, so let's see what else. Uh, how many colleges should a student apply to? We have, we recommend uh, generally around 10. And that list needs to be balanced between likely admits, target admits, and then you can, once you have out of 10, I would say three likelies, three targets, base it on admission rate, okay? Don't base it on trying to figure out where you fall into that because a school that has an admission rate, let's say under 10%, it doesn't matter if you're valedictorian or not, uh, you're, it's still gonna be what we call a lottery school. So after adding three likelies, three targets, we generally, then we say to students, do you wanna add any reaches or uh, lottery schools? And lottery, because once you've optimized your applications, uh, the results are really a lottery because uh, of the way that college admissions is run in the United States right now. There is something called institutional agendas that are not shared with us and they change every year. That means the goals of the college, and that includes, for many colleges, this issue of yield or the percentage of students admitted who actually enroll. Uh, we have on our team, we have two uh, former admissions uh, officers, and uh, you know they told us this is this is these are this is the truth. This is not my opinion. Um, this is how it's run. Um, and you know when I was interviewing for Princeton. I would have talks every year with admissions there about um, this and that student. And basically these super competitive schools, they can admit 10, 15 equally qualified students for each slot that they have available. So how are they gonna make that final decision between the 10 or 15? It's going to come down to what their agenda, their goals are for the year. Do we need more people from Montana? Do we need um, a star clarinetist? Do we need, you know, what do we need for this uh, club? I mean, it, it comes down to things like that. So when you know that, then you realize you have to have a balanced college list to protect students. It doesn't matter how accomplished they are. It still has to be balanced. Um, Okay, other question. What is the most important thing students should consider when deciding on a college to attend? The most important thing is fit. Kind of talked about it at the beginning, right? So um, the, the fit of the college, it, that is not just about the major or the location. It needs to be about financial fit. How about things like, what is the culture, campus culture like? Do I see myself there for four years? One great way to figure that out is to be able to spend a little bit of time during the school year. Some high schools allow for that, or if your spring break, or if your breaks are not the same as the colleges, you can go and talk to students. Um, but there are many online uh, options to find out about colleges as well. There are virtual information sessions you can sign up for. There are virtual tours you can take. There are even student ambassadors at some of these colleges that you can talk to. Uh, so fit is going to be extremely important. And we have about 10 criteria for fit, right? We've mentioned location, we've mentioned major, we've mentioned campus culture, but what about things like size? You know, uh, how does size influence the student experience? Uh, there are other factors like, is Greek life or fraternities and sororities important to you? Or do you want to be on a college that has no fraternities and sororities? Some people feel very strongly about these things. Um, so there are factors, right? And what you want is to truly take them into consideration. Don't downplay them. Because whether you're a student or a parent, remember uh, that your experience there thriving, hopefully, is going to determine, is going to have an impact on your academic performance. And also, you know, four years out of a life, that's a long time. We want those to be enjoyable. We want you to look back on those years 
uh, in, in, a, in a positive way. So um, let's see, do you offer payment plans to cover your services? We do, absolutely. Uh, so if, again, if you're serious about working with us, we would be delighted to meet with you and explain how it all works. So please, um, if uh, Alexis, if you could put that link back into the uh, chat, that would be fantastic. Okay, well, um, I am very glad that we had this time together. I wish you a, a wonderful conclusion of high school, if that's where you're at, or an exciting journey. And just keep in mind that the college application process does not have to be an ordeal. It can be an amazing journey where you learn about yourself and you explore the world and explore careers and majors and different opportunities. Um, there are some incredible, um, incredible options for scholarships. There are full rides. Uh, we have a, a great list of full rides. Um, so if you're, you know, exceptionally high achieving, that can be a wonderful opportunity. But in any case, uh, do uh, do prioritize the idea of um, enjoying your time uh, and not only focusing on getting in. Okay. Uh, I see something in the Q&A. Ah, okay. I think we're good. All right. And chat. Yes. Okay. Well, thank you all and hope to see you soon um, in, uh, in, in, uh, in cyberspace. Thank you everyone for joining tonight. Today's webinar is being recorded and will be posted on our YouTube channel. If you have any questions, please feel free to email me at alexis.adams at nshss.org. Enjoy the rest of y'all's evening. Bye-bye.